So my name is Gretchen Baki. I'm a um, professor in the anthropology department, um, and I work, um, I've been working for the last decade on the um, transition of um, the U.S. electric grid. So again, it's a very much a case study of the U.S. Um, so because I'm an anthropologist, I'm going to talk a little bit differently um, than everybody else. I'm going to tell a lot more stories, and I'm going to use fewer graphs. Um, so you will see this, this is about to come to pass. Um, I think what's important, um, to, what underlies what I want to say um, is that as an, as an anthropologist, what I think about is the way in which ideas um, underlie um, infrastructural and energy changes. So ideas about reliability, about a stable planetary climate, and also ideas about finance, um, how profits are made and how losses are counted. And all of these matter to the ways in which the electricity system is changing right now, including the, the push for microgrids, micro um, especially in densely populated areas and very sparsely populated areas. Um, and that push for microgrids, which is just sort of one piece of the whole big story, is symptomatic of what might be called a popular shift in infrastructural expectations. Um, so that's sort of my, where I'm coming from. Um, so I'm going to start with the future. I want to just talk a little bit about the, the grid, the big grid. Um, so the future is coming. Um, and you should, you should see it with both anticipation and dread, right? Um, the grid in 2070 is not going to look like, work like, or be managed like it was in 1970, nor should it be. After all, in 1870, the very first battery-powered electric light was illuminated in the window of a San Francisco priest. Um, a century is a very long time in our world electric, and every transformation to our grid signals the transformation of our society as a whole. Microgrids are going to have a place in this transition, and this is fairly well assured at this point. Um, and by microgrid, I mean, there's the, everybody will give their own definition because even though we only argued about lunch, um, there was another issue that came up. Um, so what I mean is an islandable electrical system comprised of a robustly networked, diverse assortment of distributed energy resources. Um, so, but before I get there, the future, right? The future is coming. So I was recently talking to a local Montreal consultant, Pierre Descharmes, who specializes in, is in issues relating to energy, including the grid, but also uh, in transport. And I said something foolish uh, to him about the future, which was, nobody really knows what's coming next, right? And he looked at me and he said, I know what's coming next. And then I realized that I also knew what was coming next. Um, so I thought it was funny how that worked. So here's what he knew, right? Generation storage, and devices that allow one to manage both, about both of these efficiently will be moving much closer to where we use electricity, and they will scale down to match this usage. Um, this is not the same as saying that everyone is going to go off the big grid, though that tends to be the fear when we start talking about micro and nano grids. This was not where Ducharme was headed. He didn't say anything about who will own and manage these resources, nor about how they will or will not be networked. He just said that they will get smaller and more local that the proximate need for electricity will be matched by approximate capacity to supply it, and the fact of this matching will produce certain effects. Here's one of those. A couple of weeks later, I was talking to a software developer who works with Duke Energy, a utility in the southeastern US. His interest is in providing a tool for architects and planners to use in the early phases of building design, so that instead of just plopping some solar panels in at the, on at the end, um, which is sort of the retrofitting model, it will be easier to run a cost-benefit analysis on different potential ways of making, storing, and sparing electricity for a building before the plans for the structure are actually built, sort of drawn up. His point was that if load reduction, or how much power a building needs, comes first, before considerations about local generation and storage, then buildings are made to a much higher level of efficiency structured in from the start. The take-home message was, when people are generating power for themselves, they are way better at optimizing consumption. What a software does is make it possible to optimize consumption first and plan for generation second. He's not obviously the only person doing this. Add to this what I know about the future. Person-to-person -person energy trading is going to become the norm, probably using the blockchain or a similar sort of distributed ledger system, um, maybe using a platform. Um, so we were just talking about this, that it's uh, up live in Auckland. Um, I was reading about this today. 500 different uh, organizations in Auckland are actually doing this now using the blockchain, person-to-person um, -person energy trading. In Holland, there is a platform in place. 
Um, in Bangladesh, there's swarm electrification, four million rooftop panels in Bangladesh, um, the fastest growing home solar system in the world. Um, so this is coming. Um, taken together, thus, we have generation and storage that will get closer to where power is used and be matched to the scale and power quality of that usage, plus consumption that is heading for a kind of optimization we can barely imagine, and that excess power easily made with renewables, if not always predictably so, um, will be sold between individuals. And by individuals, here I mean any entity that makes power a grid-connected solar home system as much as a microgrid when not in island mode. This level of radical market, market integration is often called the uberization of electricity markets, though I personally hope that it can be designed in such a way that is less exploitive, sexist, and generally terrible than Uber is for the people who work for them. Um, anyway, you can imagine it really easily, right? Never again a couple of solar panels on an otherwise empty roof, right? If Elon Musk, who we certain people hate, um, has his way, in a decade or so we won't even see the solar panels at all, but regardless of whether they are visible or not, Local sites for making electricity will be maximized, load will be minimized, and whatever isn't used by the producer will be sold by that producer to someone in particular and moved via distribution lines, which will remain a unique resource uh, a small scale, at small-scale transfers of power. All of this will be normal, plus the Internet of Things, plus probably low-voltage DC systems, plus dispatchable conservation, plus hopefully the mass integration of renewables. This begins to form the parameters of a grid for 2070, which is very different than the system that was, that I think of as the 1970 model, um, which is what we have in Quebec um, for the most part now, and was very, was the norm in most of the industrialized world for most of the 20th century. So here's all these things. Um, so I won't go into that normal one, but you all know it, the vertically integrated monopoly. Um, we're here. So we're essentially halfway between the 1970 model and the 2070 model. And the one thing that I think this conversation does is it helps us turn our face toward the 2070 and away from the 1970. That's, that's why I've put this up, um, to think about looking forward and what are the intermediate steps that are necessary to come to this point in a sane uh, and sort of reliable way. So right now, if you ask your students or if you are a student, you say, hey, go tell me about the electric grid, you're gonna, guess, you're gonna see this, this is the Wikipedia entry on the electric grid. It looks nothing like, right, what the, the future that is coming. It looks, still looks like this old grid. Um, So, foam. Um, there's a lot of talk in, in uh, talking about microgrids in, in, um, in densely populated areas that there will be some sort of foam. So if you imagine each of these bubbles is a microgrid and they will be networked together. Uh, so there's sort of some sorts of generation, some sorts of storage, so a couple of loads in each of these bubbles and they'll be able to work essentially like the big grid works today. Um, but also operate in island mode. This is kind of the fantasy of the 2070 grid. Uh, it's not the only fantasy, right? Um, this, is another w this is another way to think about it. Um, dendrites, um, this is a very interesting model because it's quite a lot like what Amtrak is suggesting um, for their microgrid. So you don't have to have a bubble that's in a, in a particular location, but a microgrid can in fact um, follow a train line. You would have two, these would be stations warming um, sort of warming places for people if there was a big power outage, outage and you would also still be able to move um, people from one station to the next. And what's funny about dendrites is as soon as you start looking at them, they have all kinds of shapes, right? So there's many, many options, even just with this idea of what a microgrid would be. This one at the far, I didn't put this up, but the, this, I think it's C that's all the way over there, it looks quite a lot like the Quebec system today. Um, and somebody that I, I, I have a map of the, the, the system and it looks, it looks a lot like this. And somebody today said actually Quebec is a microgrid, right? It's just a big microgrid. So um, it's interesting too. Uh, so the bubble. Um, this is where we are now. So we aren't in this networked microgrid world. We're here. 
Um, people are afraid that we're going here, right? This is a house that was designed for the zombie apocalypse. So it is, a, it is a compound, cement, the thing goes down, there's a drawbridge, all of it, right? So there's all of this like microgrid, this is what, like this is everybody going to go in their compound, nobody's going to talk to each other anymore, right? But that's not uh, what any of the people that I talked to in the process of researching my book on the grid um, were actually interested in. Um, so the, this should not be taken to be, this should not be taken to be that. Um, Never in all of my experience did anybody actually, people were pissed off about the quality of their electricity and their qual the reliability of their electricity, but I never actually talked to anyone who wanted to get off the grid completely. Um, my time's up, but it's going to be like three more minutes. So, um, Lots of people are off the grid, um, but many of them are off the grid, like this fellow here actually, because the utility is asking for so much money, thousands, 17,000, 27,000 dollars to put in another pole and some lines out to where they are, out to where they live. Um, so it's not necessarily a, a, an, an ethical move, it's kind of a financial mood, move also. Um, otherwise, for the most part in my research, people really did believe in electricity as a common good. So both in fact and in mind. Um, and that this, coupled with small-scale generation, is an impressive driver of actually what's changing the grid and pushing us sometimes toward this. Um, that, and I'll say this again differently. It's now possible to generate small amounts of electricity locally and greenly with solar and small wind. And most people want to be able to contribute what they don't use of this generation into a common system. They want to be paid for it. But what is important here is the value of, that they place is not in hoarding this resource, but in creating a genuine common market um, without putting their own energy security at risk. Even better if energy security can also be on offer, right? And this gets to the, I'm ending now, this gets to what Chris is saying. In the same way that in the wake of the big ice storm in Quebec, people gathered together in the homes of, of friends with fireplaces, right? So too after Superstorm Sandy, um, places with microgrids, university campuses, and mostly and hospitals became sites of comfort, care, and conviviality. Extending the reach of, not, um, of that is not just about building a new kind of electricity system with market-based electricity trade efficiency and green power in, built in from the start, but it's also about extending communitarian sociability in a pinch. It's this bubble, not as a compound, but as a resource, because if um, before we begin to worry too much about how microgrids might be wired together into a single foam-like big grid, it's good to see how they are working right now as bubbles or dendrites of warmth, light, and power, conversation, transport, coffee, medical treatment, etc., providing a social good as much as the first technological steps towards a total systems overhaul. And that's all I have to say. I will Thank now you. introduce you.